All right. Okay. Amazing. All right. So let's get started. So I was doing some research about you. I was going through your Wikipedia page. Very, very intense Wikipedia page you have. Um, I, I, so that's uh, great. I have to read it sometime. Uh, <laughs> It's uh, it's it's uh, it, uh, my experience, however, is that when you read about yourself, uh, it can be an agonizing experience overall. So anyway, <laughs> um, so I learned that you write you wrote a lot about topics like religion, philosophy, theology, and eclipses. You know, reading your chapter, I understand your background and understand how that came to play into the chapter about eclipses, but or the 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 chapter in the eclipses book but i was wondering how you came to write about eclipses um you know and and how that happened i know you have a specific experience with the 2017 eclipse um so maybe that played into that but yeah i just wanted to throw that first question at you well as it happens that year uh both henrika lange whom you know and tom mcleish who sadly passed away this last year uh far too young, uh, from pancreatic cancer, were both fellows at the same uh, institute that I was, the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study. And uh, Tom, of course, uh, was a scientist of considerable range uh, who had a special interest in the topic. And so we all had experienced the eclipse. We, we, I and my family actually drove down to Nashville to see it. Uh, and uh, and he he and Henrika came up with this notion of a volume devoted to the topic in the hope of getting it out before this year's solar eclipse, which they did. But unfortunately, again, Tom won't be with us to see it. Uh, and he suggested it. He suggested a, I make a contribution. That's all. Just uh, uh, mixing some of my. Uh, let's say, training in classical and, and, and medieval and in the Asian uh, traditions, but also uh, making some sort of philosophical comment on it. So I was drawn into the project. Uh, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't really my idea originally, but I'm glad I did it. Mm -hmm. And so to talk about your personal experience in the 2017 eclipse, um, that you, you mentioned in your chapter. Can you tell me a little bit about that for listeners who have, you know, no access to the book yet and have no idea what I'm talking about? Well, you may remember in 2017, uh, there was a full eclipse of the sun that was visible along a path through North America. It was on uh, the 21st of August. And uh, we decided, I, my wife, and my, my grown son, uh, decided to go see it in Nashville and take a vacation where none of us had ever been to Nashville before anyway. Um, and uh, you know, that's how we happened to see it. Now, it was, um, it was a curious week because that was also the week a few days before the eclipse. There had been the, the march of the uh, neo-Nazis and, uh, and white supremacists in Charlottesville, which, as it happens, had been where my son was born, where we had lived a great many years. I'd taken my doctorate and I had taught at the University of Virginia, and at that time I was just living in the Charlottesville area, not when the march came. At that time I was already at Notre Dame. But um, it was an incredibly uh, uh, dark and melancholy moment. And so I have to admit that the the somehow uh, the approach of the eclipse seemed especially ominous in the proper sense of that term, in the sort of uh, ancient uh, sense uh, to the of an eclipse as as being a, a presage of something terrible uh, upon the horizon, natural or historical. And um, I was perfectly prepared for the experience to deepen my melancholy. Uh, in point of fact, that's not what happened. Uh, I found it extraordinarily beautiful and somehow a, a peaceful experience. And that caused me to, to reflect on something that's very strange on all the ancient and medieval and early modern 
accounts of eclipses I had read, not just in, in Western texts, but in Asian texts and in Near Eastern texts and others, uh, in Native American lore and, and other uh, indigenous traditions, is that almost none of them, in fact, as far as I could think, until the very late modern period, none of them described the experience of an eclipse as peaceful or beautiful or <laughs> lovely. Uh, they had all, uh, if they weren't just sort of bare accounts of the phenomenon that had no emotional intonations at all, they were more often than not uh, descriptions of something terrible, something that uh, suggested doom or misfortune. Um, occasionally it might be an omen of success in battle, but only because it was uh, read as a, a dark harbinger of disaster for the other side. And quite often it's described, the, the, the experience itself is described in, 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 in those sources as something dreadful and even hideous. And this, for the first time, struck me as how, how odd this was, because that had not been my experience at all. And I wondered what it was, whether personal psychology or just the historical moment we were living in, that made my perspective so different and why I'd started in a, in a mood prepared for something ominous and, and terrible and instead it ended up emotionally entirely at the other end of the spectrum. That's, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have a little bit of a cough, but um, that's so interesting. And so did you found it and did you find an answer for yourself when it came to like understanding why and you know expecting something dark and something that would bring your mood down you actually found a moment of peace or is that so like an open question for you uh it's a little of both i mean it, it, if you've read the essay in the book you know that at the end i reflect on on both what we've gained and what we've lost as modern persons um and uh in this regard which is we may have gained a perspective on the nature of celestial phenomena that that allows us to experience things like eclipses without suffering terror or or anxiety about the imminent future um although i want to point out that that even ancient astronomers uh were often quite aware that eclipses could be predicted and that there was a regularity in the rotations of the of the spheres or, 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 or however they understood these things. But nonetheless, right up until the early modern period, you can even find this in, in you know, it's still being uh, invoked in, in the poetry of the Romantics and after, right up until the early period, e even those who knew this still saw that regularity as somehow having a kind of fated quality to it in which it also indicated uh, the, the turning of fortune's wheel, so to speak. And perhaps a liberation from that terror uh, is one of the things we've gained in having, at least since the... the uh, scientific revelation, uh, revolution of the 17th century uh, distanced ourselves from cosmic phenomena in that way and, and begun to think of them as more mechanical events, which I think, by the way, philosophically is somewhat incorrect, but nonetheless, that's a different issue. On the other hand, though, I realized that there's also behind that liberation from terror uh, a considerable and in, and in many ways unfortunate disenchantment as well. That is that we've also embraced in the modern period a kind of metaphysics of dead matter, the notion that the cosmos around us is essentially dead, that life is a sort of anomaly, anomaly in the midst of death and consciousness more so, and that the, the world out there doesn't have any presence to us as something that speaks to us, that sends us signs and portents, but instead we see it as a, as simply a great reserve of material resources to be exploited or mechanical phenomena to be calculated 
or natural perils or obstacles to be averted or surmounted, but not as something that engages us spiritually, imaginatively, poetically, and morally. And to me, that's a great impoverishment and to a great extent explains why we're able to destroy the natural order around us with such ease of conscience, because we don't see it as the habitation of numinous powers or of a spiritual depth of reality or of, or of the, the deeper grounds of consciousness, something that we're responsible for. We see it as something to be mastered and exploited. And I, I think that's a great tragedy, and it's very much part of the tragedy of late modernity and the sort of consumerist and uh, uh, insatiably consumerist, I should say, culture we've created that's, that's just a ceaseless engine of material production and acquisition. And this made me think about philosophers, some of them of an ambiguous moral status themselves, like Heidegger, who had reflected on just this sense of a loss of reverence for the mystery of being. So that was, that was I'm sorry to be so long-winded about this, but that, that, that was my, my twin reflection on the moment in history, where is that I'm a product of late modern culture, so I can't make myself see an eclipse as a pestiferous omen of doom, perhaps, and yet, in another sense, my inability to see it as that spontaneously is itself an omen of doom, because I, it means that I suffer from that same sort of coarseness of conscience that I think is, is the great pathology of the late modern age. I love, first of all, I love long-winded answers, so feel free to keep giving me those, because they're, they're the best when it comes to, you know, audio. Um, they, yeah, they're, they're, they're great. Um, but yeah, speaking of that, I just I was wondering if we could dive a little bit into the history of the cultural understanding of eclipses. Um, for example, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, starting from like the first recorded eclipse um, and, you know, through different societies and different centuries, for example, going through, you know, the Greco-Roman traditions, there's Lucretius that mentions them, and then I think it's Herodotus in Greece, um, oh, yeah, yeah. writing about, you know, that that one battle that there was an eclipse, and then the battle stopped all of a sudden. Um, so, you know. Yeah, what, uh, uh, yeah. what um, you know, what, what's interesting about this, again, as I say, is that, um, uh, from a very early period, uh, we have a, a, accounts of eclipses, and yeah, they, they are, um, as you say, uh, almost always associated with, with uh, if not tribulations, at least uh, fluctuations of, of human fortune here below. Um, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think, I suppose that, that the earliest recorded eclipse, I, I should have, I should actually go and, and, uh, try to remember the exact date, but I think it's probably, and it's hard to say because this is a document whose dating, uh, varies as much as a millennium in the, in the scholarship, but the Xujing, uh, in China, uh, which means just a treatise or book on, on documents or documentations talks about an eclipse that that some think happened in 2134 BCE. Again, as I say, it's it's not one that's easy to um, date exactly. Um, there's an ancient Babylonian text by someone called Rasio the Elder of. Uh, about an eclipse from the seventh century in BCE, we we have similar, you know, uh, Japanese uh, Japanese accounts from the Middle Ages for the Han period, like the Genpei Josuki. Uh, but you mentioned Herodotus, and I think that would be the that that is a datable eclipse from five eighty five uh, BCE. 
which he says had been predi predicted by the by the uh, you know the pre-Socratic philosopher Thales of Miletus. Um, and and it seems to be if I mean we can't absolutely prove it happened, but it seems quite plausible that the, uh, the Lydians and the Medes on the battlefield uh, before the battle that was about to to be met were so shaken by the sight that they laid down their arms and uh, uh, agreed to an armistice. Um, I, I mean, well, that's that sort of well, there, there you have a, a, a sort of happy issue of what, what today we would think of as a superstition. Uh, I, um, and um, the only other, the only, I, 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 the only other example I can think of, a, of in which terror at the sight of an eclipse immediately led to a happy outcome for everyone involved is uh, a Japanese text called the Nihon Kiryaku. Uh, and it's it, you know from the 10th century in which uh, an eclipse led to a general amnesty being uh, issued to to condemned prisoners, you know. Um, but on the whole, I mean, over time, again and again, you see this the same pattern recurring. And if anything, um, the descriptions of the eclipses seem to be so inflected with a sense of foreboding and horror that the phenomenon itself is often exaggerated. Many of the medieval texts that I had read through preparing the essay uh, spoke of it as being dark as night, which is not what actually happens even with a full solar eclipse, and that 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 the stars were all entirely visible. Now the stars do often become visible for in a full solar eclipse, but not not entirely. It's not as if the night sky is suddenly laid bare um, in the middle of the day, um, and uh, in the the paper I or the the essay I, I produced for the volume, I, I go through a number of them in in quick order to to make this point. Um, quite often they were associated with the death of, say, a, a monarch. Um, there's a there's a early second century Chinese chronicle, the Huan Shu, uh, that links. Uh, I think it was 120, the year would be 120 CE, links the eclipse to the death of the Dowager Empress, for instance. That's just common. And even in the Christian uh, period and after in the Middle Ages, there was this, this clear association of, of eclipses with, with an impending crisis or catastrophe or grave change in the fortunes of kings or kingdoms or or great powers or a natural calamity so if i remember correctly there was one eclipse i think it was during early modern england maybe no maybe a little but it was in england i think and it was like when one of the kings i think it was one of the many henrys died that was predicted by an eclipse i think if i this might be wrong uh, uh, well no it's you're not you're not necessarily wrong um <laughs> in fact it was quite common not uh um i'm trying to remember precisely which one you may be referring to um um well, I mean, you, 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 medieval, so you're not talking about the Anglo. I'm trying to remember, of course, there are. Uh, oh, there is Harry uh, the First. William of Malmesbury, perhaps, from the century. Yeah. Um, which would. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. That would be that would be correct. Uh, there was an eclipse on 20th of March, 1140. And William of Malmesbury did indeed see it as. Uh, tied to the death of the king. So that, again, that, that was a common interpretation. And um, trying to another good example of that might be um, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles was the only one what I was thinking of that had to do with Britain in the seventh century. Again, a, a royal death. Uh, why do you ask though? Um, that one just stand out to you? 
Yeah, I think I remember I was pictured the story and I remember reading something about it. Um, and I was just getting into, you know, the cultural effects or like the, the traditions linked to eclipses. And that just struck me like the fact that they could be used to predict, you know, the death of kings and, and kind of mark the end of, a, of, of an era in some way. Yeah. Now, some some of this, of course, is is you know after the fact, you know, not necessarily. Uh, I, I don't think William of Malmesbury was claiming that the eclipse announced the death of the king in a way that anyone was was willing to predict. Although there, uh, no doubt, might have been those who would have done. But that after the fact, the king, the a, a royal death following close upon the heels of an eclipse, then explains the eclipse. Uh, so naturally, there has to be an explanation. You know, what is it that was that was portended by the event? Even though that by, by the twelfth century, and certainly William, would have been perfectly aware that the eclipse was not simply a surprise that it that that, that its approach could be calculated. But which again makes the point that that the the turning of the heavens, the turning of the wheel of fortune, are not discriminated from one another at that point. It's only from the early modern period onward that we separate the realm of spirit and consciousness and even meaning into a sphere separate from a world of mechanical force, motion, impetus, and causality. Uh, that's sort of the unique mythology of the modern age, of the, the the modern West originally, and since then ever more wherever uh, the West is, uh, especially its science has been influential, the sort of mythology of the modern age is that, that these events mean nothing because in a sense, the very reality of the cosmos around us means nothing. And there's some cultures, um, Specifically, I'm, you know, I'm focusing a lot on Native American cultures where eclipses and natural events of this, of this kind still mean something. Um, and for example, I was talking to a Native American person who is part of the Iraqis. Um, uh, no, you mean the Iroquois? Iroquois, or, or so Iroquois, sorry. Iroquois, as Americans say, Iroquois. Well, that, that's not actually a single nation or tribe that, that historically was a confederacy. So... Well, a person might have been, say, Seneca or something else and a member of the Iroquois. But anyway, yeah, please go on. I'm... Thank you for correcting me, though. No, um, okay. English is not my first language, and sometimes well, I struggle with I, I, the word. Well, it's also it's a slightly recherche. Native American studies was another thing I dabbled quite a lot in early in my, my career. So, um... Oh, that's great. It's so interesting. But, yeah, he was telling me that, um, you know, when they when all the tribes kind of became part of the of the confederacy the sign that they had to kind of unite was an eclipse a solar eclipse and i found that fascinating and he was telling me that although today they you know they recognize a spiritual element in it they no longer you know celebrate it there is no particular prayers or stuff like that they just you know they enjoy it and it stands as a symbol of unity but he was telling me that other tribes for example you know they do prayers and they reunite and it's such an important moment of their tradition um mm. to celebrate and i was wondering how you know what what's different in the way that they perceive well if you think about it i mean that, that's a good example of a kind of liminal cultural uh condition somewhere between the ancient notion of of nature itself as also a world of intelligible symbols and meanings, and the modern view of, of, of nature devoid of that meaning, the middle is now occupied there in, in uh, recognizing the symbol as a cultural motif passed on that has a meaning within cultural practice, but it's still been alienated from the perception of nature. It may not have been completely conscripted into the modern project of, of, of treating all of that as just quaint folklore, mythology, and nursery fables for pre-modern cultures, and the sort of condescending view that, that um, Western modernity has often taken of such things. You know, it's just pre-scientific. 
but it's still not fully at home in the world in the way that at one time humanity was or in the way those cultures were. I mean, these are modern persons who still identify with a culture that has enough memory of its sense of communion with the natural order that it holds on to these symbols and uses them as a source of unity for the tradition, for, for the culture, for sustaining the language, sustaining its stories. And yet still, there's been a, a kind of disenchantment, a kind of alienation from the natural reality in which originally those cultural symbols allowed for direct participation, a sense that the natural and the cultural were not on two sides of a partition, but were one con continuous reality of participation and communion and communication. So there's something, you know, heroic in holding on to the symbol, some, but, but there's always the danger that it becomes attenuated to the point that it's little more than, say, like, you know, the uh, uh, you know shared loyalty to a sports franchise, you know, in which you all wear the hat with the well, in my case, with the Baltimore Oriole on it. Um, and so I see a kind of melancholy in that, you know, that that uh, that uh, still something has been lost, even though to some degree those cultures are trying to hold on to more of what we as Western modern persons have totally forsaken. They're still trying to perhaps preserve some embers of the the uh, sacred fire, trying to to retain some sense of reverence before nature, rather than just seeing it as an opportunity for coming up with some new useless device to purchase. Um, so, yeah, I, that was. That was such an insightful answer. I really, you put into words something that I think was in my head, but I didn't have the tools to put out. So um, that was really great. Um, on To continue on that line of thought, do you think that, you know, it's, you know, we can't predict the future, but because of the way that, you know, humans have evolved and, and that we have kind of abandoned that, abandoned, at least like in the West, abandoned that idea of, you know, the myth and, you know, the, 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 I need to explain this in some way. And, you know, all the tools I have are storytelling. So I'll do that. Do you think, where do you think we're headed? Do you think that one day we'll look in an eclipse and be like, meh, go on with my day? Well, I think we're, we're, we're more or less there now. I mean, it's, um, when we were down in Nashville, we, uh, found a lovely sort of secluded, place to watch it from in peace. But even then, we could hear not far away, there were people out on, the, you know, down in the city, we'd seen them before we set out, because it wasn't really that far from the city, who were on the balcony having drinks, you know, it was I, but it's not, not, I don't mean a, a small balcony, I mean a, re, a balcony restaurant. So a lot of people had gathered there for the eclipse, and they were, you know, sounding um, horns, you know, those, those kind of, you know, like aerosol cans with horns at the end and cheering and playing the, the, in the air. And it was just, uh, for them, it was, uh, you know, it was festive, it was communal, it wasn't a contemptible thing. But on the other hand, it uh, it didn't exactly uh, glow with the numinous the way it did, you know, whereas my experience at the distance happily didn't, that wasn't very loud, it was far away. And in fact, I may have seen that on the news afterwards when I got back, I hope I did. I, my memory now has it's been seven years. Um, my experience was still one of all, it, even then, even though uh, my habits of mind as a modern person had prepared me just to see it as an interesting celestial phenomenon. My my generally uh, superstitious nature, I mean, I've tried to cultivate in myself a superstitious nature because I think it's a healthy one. Um, it, it would, you know, what would be called superstitious is that, you know, I, I, I don't believe in a universe of dead matter, and I don't believe in the mechanistic philosophy. I think it's a fundamentally false picture of reality 
they can't explain consciousness or life or the way the two interact. But for the most part, uh, you know, I'm conscious in myself that there's a degree of willful, it's sort of like a willful suspension of modern disbelief in my case, that has to be a practice of mind, almost a discipline of the, of, of, of the will in order to achieve it. And I think that for most of us more and more, we see all these things uh, as interesting, even spectacular, but ultimately meaningless and ordinary. Because you see, the whole natural order, if we think of it with um, a sufficiently open mind, if we allow ourselves to cease calculating and seeking power and control and egoistic desire, we are at times aware of a kind of wonder, one that we all felt at times as children, but tend to forget or press out of mind, a, a sort of wonder at the sheer thereness and beauty and strangeness of the world. And we lose that as we age, and we also have lost that as we've aged as a culture. And if we possess it, then, then every phenomenon, every natural phenomenon would already be extraordinary to us. The thing that's shocking now as moderns is even phenomena that are genuinely extraordinary in the sense that they fall well out of the normal course of, of events day to day, like a solar eclipse. It's something rare. It's something you have to be in the right place to see, and it's good to know when it's coming, and you have to make plans. Where, where in fact, will be the upcoming eclipse. We've got a hotel room in, in the path of the eclipse, so we can watch it again and sort of celebrate the life of, of, of Tom McLeish, and, because originally I'd hoped we'd be seeing it with him by our side. Um, even that evokes little wonder in us. Uh, so it's not so. How much less the world that we 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 deal with every day, the the world that I think, if we were more healthy in our our view of reality, would speak to us and make moral demands on us and uh, tell us that that a life lived entirely for material. Uh, production and consumption and gain, no matter what it destroys, no matter what it kills, is insane and evil. Um, but you need that capacity for wonder. And if, and I think we have reached a point where even the most like, extraordinary things, I mean, if the sun turns purple tomorrow, our mechanistic habit of thought will say, will, will not be it will be, you know, surprise, but it won't be the sort of surprise that, that, that says, you know, this is significant of something. It would be what series of mechanical causes led to this phenomenal effect. That's, uh, that's so, oh, sorry, you were going to say something. No, else? I was just saying, and uh, to be honest, I'm, since I'm, uh, maybe it's morbidity on my part, but I tend to think that that, that does not presage well for the future in that sense. Again, it is an ill omen uh, in the negative now. It's our inability to be shocked by it and see it as an omen that's most ominous. And I was an, I was an English major in undergrad, and all this talk really reminded me of, of Blake, you know, Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience, and that idea of the child and being able to you know the poet it, the poet is a child according to blake right poet, is the, the, yeah. the person who can go back to to that innocent state and maybe that's what we need and you know to, yeah. to save ourselves in a way to like kind of go back to that innocent well, one of one of the um in in the songs of innocence especially one of the most uh evocative of the poems there and just that because it is i think it's it's a it's an image of all of us in this world, and the poet especially is the one who sees it. Is the is the poem called "The Echoing Green," um, which is just it seems it's just about children pet playing out on the on the the green sward. Uh, but uh, I was raised as a child high Anglican, so I was raised with the Anglican Psalter. So it, the poem ends, and it seems it's just about the children being called in 
to play, but it ends, you know, talks about them leaving and it says, and then, you know, and they will be no more seen on the echoing green. And anyone who grew up with the Anglican Psalter, as just about all of Blake's contemporaries in Britain would have done, would recognize that as, as from the Coverdale Psalter, uh, you know, before I go away, hence, and be no more seen. So those lines, be no more seen, it actually is about death. And uh, the poem is, uh, you know, he knew what he was doing. He's using that to make the, the, the image of, of the children at play uh, is, is an image of our entire life in this world if, if, like the poet, we can have that innocent eye and be the child who knows the world we're in before we're called home. That is, that's, yeah, so much, so much food for thought in that, right? Um, anyway, that, um, I don't have the extension Zoom, so the call will close in about one minute. So that was just a, I think that was a good marking, you know, ending, ending point for us. Um, so yeah, I just want to take this last minute to really thank you for this time. It was such an interesting conversation. I wish Zoom didn't have a time limit. 